Welcome to this edition of Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qingdu. Leaders from Asian and European countries are meeting to discuss multilateralism with an eye on economic recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang delivered a speech at the 13th Summit of Asia-Europe Meeting, or ASEAN. So what's been happening during the meeting and how will this focus on multilateralism help promote global development and prosperity? To find out, I'm joined by Professor John Gong at the University of International Business and Economics and Mikhail Garacci, former Under Secretary of State of the Ministry of Economic Development of Italy. So welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Mikhail. So, what's your takeaway of this meeting, which lasted basically, you know, probably for uh, one more day to go? It's a, it's a, always a, a positive event when uh, uh, block trading blocks like Europe and Asia uh, meet to discuss how to improve terms of trade, especially true in this time of uh, a pandemic. Uh, there is uh, so there are some issues that need to be uh, discussed and uh, solved because uh, we have always the situation where when we have uh, two blocks that are at different stages of development, uh, Europe uh, relatively well developed, uh, Asia with few exceptions still a developing uh, continent, the needs of those two blocks may be, may be different. We do know that for example, in the case of China, since uh, entering to the WTO 20 years ago, China has benefited a lot. Uh, other uh, emerging markets have also benefited uh, from uh, trade uh, because we do know that trade narrows disparity in between countries. The thing that uh, we need to fix is that, however, it creates uh, disparities within the country. And we have seen this uh, in some Asian countries. We've seen this uh, in the European countries. We've seen this in the United States. So what this meeting need to address uh, is not just how to improve the terms uh, and uh, lower the disparity between regions of the world, but also how each national government should address the disparity within their own countries. And this is the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. uh, well, John, uh, you know, looking at the meeting like, from Asian angle, uh, what's your take? Well, let me say that um, uh, this is mostly a forum for exchange opinions, exchange ideas. Um, in terms of uh, solving uh, problems, solving issues, I, I, I don't think it's, uh, it, it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a platform to uh, really uh, enforce things. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, your, your previous speaker is absolutely right that uh, there are existing problems both in Europe and Asia uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, especially, uh, you know, issues relating to sustainable development and as well as uh, equality issues, uh, things like that. Um, but I think uh, at this point, um, it, you know, in terms of uh, really solving problems, uh, I am a little bit skeptical, uh, especially uh, this is not a forum uh, for addressing issues in each respective block of countries. Uh, and particularly also true for the reason that uh, this is an expanding, it has seen expanding membership. I mean, it's not just the the, the original uh, European Union and uh, uh, ASEAN countries, and plus uh, China, South Korea, and Japan. Now you're not seeing, uh, starting to see other countries like Russia and Kazakhstan, and other countries joining the, this discussion as well. And you know, it, it, when you have a, such a, a diverse set of uh, countries with diverse set of interests, uh, it's probably going to be very difficult to uh, really uh, solve uh, uh, real problems. Uh, so I, I, some people say that the the ASEM is, is mostly a talking shop. Uh, I, I actually tend to agree that uh, it's a forum for exchanging ideas, or ex expressing opinions, um, but it, it's not going to be going very far in terms of solving real problems. Mm -hmm. uh, probably this mechanism is not designed to solve really specific problems. But anyway, you know, in particular at the time of the pandemic, you know, having leaders from right. different parts of the world to talking to each other, uh, you know, through the video link is a good thing. Um, you know, the one thing they discussed uh, actually is uh, the theme of the meeting is the multilateralism uh, for shared uh, growth. They use the word strengthening multilateralism. Mm -hmm. So, John, 
Uh, you know, when mm -hmm. they focus on the multilateralism, usually it means there's something wrong with multilateralism. For example, the weakening of multilateralism over the past years, in particular, and Donald Trump, you know, uh, the unilateral approach, uh, for example, has uh, damaged this uh, practice of multilateralism. What we can do right now, like uh, for European countries, for Asian countries, uh, to strengthen multilateralism? Yeah, I think the you know they they have a very interesting idea that they call the minilateralism. I think the idea came about uh, amidst the, the dysfunction and the failure of the you know absolute multilateralism uh, that has been prevailing in several uh, international organizations. For example, at WTO, we need to build consensus. What does it mean by? Uh, building consensus. That means that every member state has to agree. And this is becoming increasingly difficult. I think there are countries that are very frustrated with this process, that uh, uh, things are very difficult to get done, that things are getting very slow to get done. Um, and, and I think this very concept, idea of minilateralism, meaning that uh, uh, to find uh, common denominators among just a few set of countries and uh, try to uh, you know, solve problems, try to uh, do things, uh, is actually a quite interesting idea. And I think uh, if this is workable uh, within you know, the larger context of uh, international uh, order, the international order, UN-based international order, and this is something that can be indeed explored more than the and, and workable in my view uh, on some issues that probably uh, don't um, uh, you know uh, become uh, I, I, of conflict with a, a lot of countries and I think it's indeed you know let's have a starting point with a few select few uh, number of countries um, and uh, and build some consensus only among this uh, small subset of countries but um, you know, really implement things, really do things, uh, move things forward. And I think that's an interesting approach that uh, needs to be explored. And I think uh, this forum uh, could be a starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Michaela, obviously, um, Joy uh, mentioned uh, this, uh, <laughs> like a popular uh, phrase here, mineral, minilateralism uh, to strengthen multilateralism. Uh, if you take a look at uh, the uh, current practice, you see there's a uh, uh, for example, in Asian, um, you know, Pacific region, there's uh, RCEP uh, to go into effect uh, early next year. You have uh, TPCPP, you know, uh, DCP, uh, I believe, and also like China, Europe, uh, EU, European Union, this investment deal I mean, to be approved by both sides. It's more like a regional or bilateral liberalization free trade. Uh, but multilaterally or globally, like WTO is still being paralyzed. Uh, what's your idea, you know, what we need to do, in particular for Asia and European countries uh, to, again, you know, uh, prop up the multilateralism? Well, you know, there's two ways to develop uh, multilateralism. One is uh, top-down, so 200 countries uh, join uh, and discuss and agree on uh, what to do. And the other one is uh, uh, bottom-up. So we start with bilateral then it's bilateral, becomes a regional agreement, then someone does it in Europe, someone does it in Asia, in America, Canada, Mexico, they had the NAFTA, and then these uh, uh, components are like a puzzle. You build the small pieces, they get bigger and bigger, they even overlap, like you said, the CCPT and the RCEP have an overlap, and then uh, this uh, is the driver that leads uh, to multilateralism, on which then the WTO does the job uh, to manage all these. So I do think that these uh, regional or even bilateral agreements uh, are not against the, the multilateralism, are actually positive building blocks. And of course, we need to recognize that uh, if we want to reach uh, a true global trade system that works, uh, we need the leadership uh, of the three, four main economic blocks uh, in the world. So you mentioned, for example, the EU-China agreement, that is also good. We even can discuss about the US-China phase one agreement uh, that was uh, signed uh, a while back between uh, Vice Premier Liu He and uh, Lai Taiza in the previous administration. Some people were a little bit skeptical or even worried that this would lead to only bilateral leaving out the rest of the world. But if done well, they actually can lead. You know, I do the example in Glasgow, COP26, uh, countries could not agree. And then on Friday night, we had the agreement between China and the US. 
the two leaders in this agenda, let's say the biggest uh, uh, country that emits CO2, so that they are the problem. And also they came up with some sort uh, of a common statement to say, we can now together provide the solution. And then everyone else would follow. And I think that's why I believe that this bilateral or even regional agreement do serve the purpose of building blocks for a larger ones. So I'm, I'm very positive, provided that then everything feeds into the WTO that needs to be the overall, let's say, uh, uh, referee of uh, the trade issues. Mm -hmm. Well, Miguel, well said over there. Uh, you know, one uh, session uh, was devoted to the discussion uh, for connectivity. You know, uh, you, uh, this word itself uh, reminds me of uh, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I mean, if there's one feature to describe uh, this initiative, it's really about the uh, connection or connectivity, physically or, I mean, in, uh, in, in, in uh, tangible, for example, the soft uh, connection, people to people, for example, in particular between Asian countries and uh, uh, I would say European continent, you know, the connectivity over there, the real service, for example, from China to some of the European uh, ports during this pandemic have worked very well. I, mean, wh I wonder what comment do you have for that, you know, for that connectivity? Well, as you know, I'm a big fan of the Belt and Road Initiatives. Uh, and it's not because it's done by China. It's because I think it's a good idea. It's because I think that Asia and Africa and Europe and even America do need the development on infrastructure. I've seen how China has managed to grow the economy and be successful also via building transport. You know, 10 years ago, in 2008, there was only the Beijing-Tianjin high-speed railway. Now we almost have 40,000 kilometers of high speed, and this has changed the life of people. So it's a transformational uh, investment. Uh, it's not uh, a evolutionary one. In the case of China, it's been a revolutionary by changing the way people live, work, uh, travel. And this, of course, has created more connectivity, the one you're referring to, soft between people. I make uh, some trivial example, people from Shanghai, have been closer in contact with people coming from uh, rural areas that migrated uh, thanks to this transport and they work together. And this has lowered uh, maybe some uh, pre prejudice that uh, we have uh, also within countries, even bigger when we're talking about intra-countries, inter-countries, so between one country and the other one. So welcome to the Belt and Road. Even the Build Back uh, Better World, the uh, G7 US-led initiative, that's also excellent. You know, the world has room for all initiatives. And if there is a healthy competition between the BRI, which by the way, is not China, is 100 plus countries, and the Build Better, Better World, which is some European Western countries, some of which are also part of the Belt and Road, it's excellent. Asia and Africa, 6 billion people, do need this kind of joint relationship and development. And this also helps smooth the geopolitical tensions that we may have because you know when it is companies and individual they find jobs they find the business opportunities so the it's government a, yeah listen. It's, it's all good about the connectivity uh, nothing bad about that uh, let's move on uh, the u.s has been listed as backsliding in democracy for the first time by european think tank in the meanwhile, a UN human rights expert said that the electoral laws in some parts of the U.S., including Texas, may undermine democracy by depriving millions of citizens who belong to minority groups of the equal right to vote. Why is the American democracy in distress? What does it take to overcome the challenges? Can they do it? For this part, again, we have John and uh, uh, Mikhail. Uh, John, you know, are you surprised to see the U.S. Uh, being listed uh, you know, as a part of the country with backsliding democracy. There's no deniable, it's not deniable that uh, absolutely that is what's exactly happening in the United States. I mean, look at, I would just point out a couple of things. First of all, I mean, the June 6 riot is, 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 is very clear as an insurrection, right? But the, the U.S. Congress cannot introduce a 
a, 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 a statement uh, on this thing. Uh, uniformly, you know, uh, 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 unify the both aisles of the Congress to issue a statement about this. There are those people, uh, mostly on the GOP side, just being resisting on a, f a fair investigating this issue. Um, you look at the the, uh, the voter suppression legislations across the country in southern states, in the state of Georgia and the state of Texas and, and some other states. And, and there, what's that? What what are these legislations for? Nothing more than suppressing the, the minority uh, population voters from going out and and, and cast a vote, uh, cast a ballot. And 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 this is just you know deployable. I think this is now going on across the. Uh, 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 landscape across the country in the United States, and uh, I think um, a backsliding is a uh, is an understatement. I mean, there are people who are saying that there, you know, there could be those very, very dangerous moments where the, the American sort of liberal democracy is going to is going to be totally ruined by uh, by this uh, ex president, but as well as uh, you know other very strong supporters in the Congress, uh, these uh, GOP. Uh, senators and congressmen. So, um, you know, I, I think if you talk to any political scientists uh, in the university community, there's no denial, no denying mm -hmm. that the, uh, the, the, the U.S. democracy is, is going through a backsliding right now. Yeah, uh, uh, Michaela, okay, probably no dispute by the U.S., you know, something wrong with the democracy over there. Uh, mostly people focus on Donald Trump, for example, his rejection of the 2020 uh, election result. Um, but uh, some other would say this is a much bigger uh, issue than Trump himself. Do you agree? I do, uh, because uh, democracy, let's not forget, it comes from the Greek demos kratos, which means uh, power to the people. Uh, we have maybe forgotten this origin and we have now in the West associated democracy with the voting. Um, and sometimes voting is not the only way to give people power, to give power to the people. It, it is, and it may work in some countries, but it may work less in other countries. But I think we in the West have been stuck with the confusing the end with the mean and the mean with an end. We have forgotten what democracy means and we have just been, uh, in a way, happy, content, satisfied to let people vote. And of course, every voting system has its problem. The US, uh, they vote by states, so the popular vote is not the same as the uh, vote of the grand uh, ele electors. Uh, we have in England a first-past-the-post system where you can be the number two parties with uh, uh, even a, a, a 60 70 percent uh, the popular vote and you get zero seats in the uh, British Parliament, in the House of Commons. These are extreme situations, of course. But then that's why we are stuck with making this uh, voting mechanism closer to giving back power to the people. And then we have another issue, which is uh, the layering. And we are debating, even in my country, the value and the, uh, the, the, the advantages of having a direct democracy or indirect. We have people voting for the U Italian parliament, then the Italian parliament uh, selects the government, then the government selects the representative in Brussels, and then the European Commission decides. So we have like four layers. And, you know, this is a big challenge that we need to address because we cannot have 60 million, in the case of Italy, representative. But the more layer we have, the least people have power. Mm -hmm. uh, well, John, uh, the good point, uh, you know, by uh, Michaela, you know, people have the power and also democracy as a means or as end itself. If you look at democracy, usually people think about the electoral democracy uh, in the Western style, for example. Uh, but China, China stressed very much about, uh, you know, this uh, all process of people's democracy with some election, with some promotion. And it stressed very much about the ends, it means that whether you can deliver. Yeah, I, I think this is a uh, hits the nail right on the head. You know, the discussion about whether democracy is a means to an end or just the end. You know, what is democracy good for if at the end of the day it doesn't solve any problem? It doesn't solve the 
the, the inflation problem, for example, the supply chain shock problem, if it doesn't solve the poverty problem, all these things are, are, are note for average folks if uh, uh, their you know, very life is not being solved by this process, by the system. Uh, so I think um, the idea that President Xi raised is actually a very good idea, I think interesting idea, to view democracy from the from the perspective of a whole process, the whole process, what he described as a whole process democracy. Um, I, I think what the, the Communist Party here in China, is their, their main uh, mentor, mentor is that uh, it's people-centered agenda. That's what President Xi is being insisted on and being adamant about, uh, you know, to try to solve people's problem. You know, here we solve the, the poverty alleviation problem, for example, the uh, um, you know, we're now getting into uh, uh, issues of uh, solving the housing problem, medical uh, insurance, medical access problem, uh, education issues, and all these things that, that really people care about. Um, so, so I think here's a very uh, a sharp uh, contrast here. Uh, in the United States, it's more about uh, the voting, about the uh, uh, congressional uh, politics. Uh, uh, you know, I, I just give you one example. You know, America needs desperately some infrastructure improvement. We've been talking about this ever since 2016 when President Trump came to power. Uh, he was proposing this idea about making America great again. Instead, he made America, you know, backsliding to a, a, a backsliding in terms of democracy. But on infrastructure, he did nothing. Um, it took Joe Biden, thank goodness, and he passed this bill. It took Joe Biden, uh, President Biden, uh, six, 11 months to just to get this bill passed, right? Um, and finally, you know, starting to have this $1.7 trillion of infrastructure improvement. It took, so, you know, if you put this thing together, five years to get the infrastructure bill. And it took us two years just to build the railway from the high speed railway from Beijing to Shanghai. You know, 1,300 uh, square, uh, kilometers long railway. Two, uh, two years, less than two years. It took the United States five years just to get this bill passed. So, uh, and I think that's the difference here. Uh, so, um, so, again, I would say, um, you know, democracy definitely is something that needs to solve problems. Otherwise, uh, I think it's it's really something just uh, uh, not good for some. Not mm -hmm. I would People say good for nothing. more problems. Yes.